Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight for our latest Brookings Mountain West lecture. I'm Bill Brown, so let me welcome you on behalf of my colleagues at Brookings Mountain West and our speaker tonight. We're going to have a nuts and bolts policy discussion about America's infrastructure, which sometimes is actually about nuts and bolts, right? But uh, uh, is more than just roads and bridges, as you might think of it covers our energy systems, and as we've seen in the headlines recently in Flint, Michigan, water and pipes and all sorts of things. And we're very fortunate tonight to have our colleague Rob Fuentes out from Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, where he's a senior fellow, and he's taught and lectured and written about this uh, at the national level uh, for quite some time. So we're going to get that national look at these issues, but in the Q&A, we can bring it down to the state and local level and have a, have a discussion about anything he says. We already have Rob's PowerPoint up on our website. So for you note takers in the audience, take a deep breath if, you, if he runs by a slide or two. Uh, we'll have the big question, of course, is in this political season of uh, how important is this as a national issue? Uh, Rob will address some of that, and we'll talk about that some more in the q and A, I'm sure. So let me turn it over to Rob. Great. Thanks, Bill, very much. And thank you all for being here on a Wednesday night. It's Wednesday? It's a nice Wednesday night uh, to talk about this issue of infrastructure. Um, it's, I usually start off these things saying that it's, you know, it's great to be out of Washington, um, to be out here in the real world. Um, but given, as Bill was saying, given the, the political context and given the nonsense that's going on in Washington these days, it's especially good to be out of, out of Washington. Um, there's really not anything going on right now other than a lot of, uh, of hand-wringing, a lot of uh, recriminations, and everything's caught up in the campaign. So it's actually really, really good to be out talking about issues here um, in the real world. And as Bill was saying, I've been working in this uh, area of infrastructure for, for a long time, 20-something um, plus years. Um, and I think we've had a lot of success taking infrastructure from kind of the back rooms and the boardrooms of the infrastructure kind of establishment where it really wasn't anything that folks were talking about a lot. And as Bill was saying, this has really been pushed, I think, to the front burner of the national policy discourse. Um, every time a bridge falls down or water is poisoned or you know, energy problems, uh, blackouts occur, people start to talk about infrastructure. And I think that's a good thing that we're talking about it. The next thing we need to do is actually start to get some stuff done. So we have an awful long way to go, but I think that we can certainly get there. Um, as Bill was saying, I know that there's an awful lot of issues that are happening here in this region when it comes to infrastructure, particularly things like water and transportation, um, and we want to talk about all of that. Um, I'm not going to mention a whole lot of those things here in this presentation. I've learned that it's hard to go into these regions and talk very specifically um, about some of these projects. You probably all know much more about them um, than I do. I'm very familiar with what's going on, um, but I'm going to keep it more at a high kind of national level. Um, but as I've been working on these issues for years, I think it's the, the other thing that's changed is that it really has new meaning today because the context for infrastructure, um, like everything else, is caught up in all of these large changes that are going on around the country now, demographically, economically, environmentally, politically, financially, all these things um, are having tremendous impact on all different areas of domestic policy, not the least of which um, is our infrastructure system. Um, so, I think all of this changes the way that, or it compels us to change the way that we do business, but all of those things have one thing in common, that they need reliable, sustainable, um, and effective infrastructure um, so we can be productive. So uh, I want to start with just a quick kind of um, uh, description of who we are at the Metro program. I know you're very familiar with Brookings. Um, the Metro program is one of the five um, programs at the Brookings Institution. I love this description that they just put in the Esquire magazine mostly because I love having the expletive up there. I think it's a great way to describe what we do. It really nails it. Um, but I also want to put up this mission here um, for a metropolitan policy program, particularly this last part, um, where we say that it, the, the mission is to deliver research and solutions to help metropolitan leaders build an advanced economy that works for all. And I put it up there because you'll notice the word infrastructure doesn't appear in there, transportation, or anything else, advanced industries, a lot of the other work that we're, that we're doing doesn't appear in the mission statement because it's all designed to get to this, this broader whole. This is what we're trying to do, and there's lots of different ways um, to get there. And infrastructure is one of those things that we care very much about. Um, the, we think that infrastructure really does form the building blocks for the American economy, 
um, whether you're thinking about things like global trade or advanced industries um, or connecting people to jobs and economic opportunity, environmental concerns, whatever it is, infrastructure is at the heart of all of these different conversations. It may not be the first thing we're talking about, and that's probably a good thing because it's mostly a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. But it's fundamental when we think about um, moving towards the American, what the American economy is all about. It also supports the American workforce to a great extent. I think people are surprised at these numbers, but we did some research a couple of years ago uh, and continue to do it, showing that a fully 11% of the American workforce is directly employed in infrastructure jobs in the United States today. That's not the guy cutting the hair, the guy who's filling the pothole. These are directly uh, employed in infrastructure in a very, very broad perspective. So 11% uh, is quite a, quite a number of people. Uh, they're particularly good jobs for people at the low end um, of the income scale, so the, the, the bottom quintile of jobs. Um, these infrastructure jobs pay very well. They're very hard to outsource. They have low barriers to entry. They bring a lot of on-the-job training with them. They're really good when we're thinking about how to boost the incomes um, of low-income workers in particular. Um, here in Las Vegas, it's just about 11%. That's a, we're right about the average here in this region. Um, for all the jobs, which one of them are employed in infrastructure, it's about 11% uh, in Las Vegas. Most of those seem to be in trucking, in freight, and, and logistics, but an awful lot in aviation, and a surprisingly large number of professional jobs in infrastructure, things like civil engineering, stuff like that. Infrastructure then also helps to achieve broad national goals. When we're thinking about these, these broad issues, connecting the um, U.S. economy to our global counterparts, when we're thinking about advanced manufacturing, we think about issues around sustainability, infrastructure is a huge piece um, of all of that. Some of these are public sector uh, investments, things you may be familiar with around transportation, public transit, things like that, water infrastructure maybe. Some of these things are exclusively private sector driven. Freight rail, for example, a lot of energy, um, so it's really, it's not, we're not just talking about government investments here, we're talking about the panoply of things um, that builds and sustains um, our infrastructure in this country. So with that as a backdrop, what I want to do is to walk through these, this is the, the, the three things I want to focus on uh, in, this, in this presentation. I want to talk deeply about those disruptive factors that I think are affecting the conversation about infrastructure today, talk broadly about what they are and then what the infrastructure components are. Uh, I want to talk about how I think the infrastructure narrative right now is too abstract, kind of as I said at the beginning, we've done a great job pushing this to the front burner of the policy discourse, we've got to get deeper, we've got to continue to, to push and to get very specific so that we're not just talking about infrastructure uh, ephemerally, we've got to talk about it specifically. And then third is that we actually do really need a new path forward. We are kind of stuck, um, a lot of that's political, a lot of that's financial, and I have some ideas for how we can do that. So the first thing uh, is that we, you know, we're, I think we're all familiar with these, with these kind of big changes that are going on here right now, but infrastructure in America, I say, faces these five realities post-recession. Demographic changes, globalization, environmental, technological, um, political, and financial. Uh, and these are huge changes, and there are urban historians who look at these changes today outside of infrastructure and just say, we haven't seen anything like this, this disruption in 100 years in this country. We've had some of these changes that have happened, but it's all happening now. Uh, at the same time having huge impacts uh, on the nation in lots of different ways. So demographically, of course, um, you know, we're, still, we're still a growing country. This isn't Western Europe, this isn't parts of Asia. The United States continues to grow. We expect maybe about 130 million more people by 2050. Um, obviously, that has lots of opportunities when it comes to infrastructure or when it comes to the country broadly. Um, we have continued labor force growth like other countries don't have. Um, we have, because of the, the demographic changes that are happening, we have better connections to the global marketplace. Um, but lots of challenges. The uh, educational inequities, particularly given the folks who are coming to this country, um, pr may present some challenges when we think about um, how we're going to get them employed in the workforce. Then this has dramatic impacts on, on infrastructure. There's lots of different ways you can pick lots of different trends here. We like to look at what's happening with um, the change in licensed drivers, which is coming because of some of these demographic changes. Huge decreases in driver's licensing, particularly for low end or for, for uh, younger folks on the scale. You can see here, um, this shows the change um, just the last couple of years. Uh, folks at the, uh, who are older are still having their driver's licenses or getting their driver's licenses, but the young people, it's really, really low, as you can see from the chart, or it's actually declining in some cases. I have two kids that are 18 years old, neither one of them have their driver's licenses. They don't have any interest in having their driver's licenses. They think it's just another thing that they have to do 
We don't drive them around. They're, just, they're much more mobile. They have different ways um, to get around. And they have different things they're interested in. One of which is connected um, through uh, advanced technologies, telecommunication systems. You can see the chart up here about access to high-speed broadband. Um, for younger folks, the, the, the adoption rate is very high, much higher than it is for, um, for older residents. The other big changes that are happening are uh, is in terms of household formation. Uh, you can see here from 1970, we had about 40% of the American, of American households were traditional, uh, traditional households, married families with children. That number is only down to 20% today. Huge implications then for the built environment, for housing, and that obviously has big impacts uh, on the transportation network. The next big change is around the globalization complexities. Um, all of the growth that's happening globally is happening in about 440 of these emerging market cities. They're going to be generating half of global GDP growth between now uh, and 2025. So the locus of economic growth is shifting away from the US and parts of Europe, particularly here to uh, Asia, Latin America, places like that. Obviously, the opportunities mean that we have lots more places to sell our uh, products here in the United States. Big uh, uh, new, new markets are opening up, which is great for, for US products. The challenges are that, you know, as Americans, we don't get out that often. And so we don't really have these, these global connections. Uh, we've got to get beyond the domestic marketplace to accommodate some of this growing demand that's happening, exploding all around the world. For infrastructure, um, the big challenge then, or the big implications are around freight and goods movement. And most of that, that movement is happening in metropolitan areas in the United States. It's not happening uniformly um, all across the country. Obviously, it's a big country. Most of that freight is being moved through our uh, metropolitan areas and just a few global gateways. So you can look at, um, this is the, the share of, of, of uh, goods that are being moved, whether it's air, water, airline ports, all of these things are happening within our major metropolitan areas. And then we look at the types of, of uh, modes that are moving all those goods. It's mostly going by water. It's mostly going by air. Huge implications then for our ports and our gateways. Again, concentrated in just a few major metropolitan areas. The next big trend is around environmental and resiliency challenges. A lot of this is you know, post Sandy that is still has huge reverberations, particularly um, on the East Coast. Um, but but uh, uh, you know, this is it's something that we have to deal with all the time. About 40% of the US population lives directly on the shorelines. Uh, local officials in these places are keenly aware of this and they're starting to rebuild their places. Uh, and huge opportunities then to remake our built landscape in these, these places along the shorelines so they can be more resilient and they can accommodate some of these, uh, uh, some of these environmental challenges which seem to be coming with much more regularity um, than we ever, I think we ever thought. The challenges then clearly are because we have really old structures. They all need to be retrofitted. That brings expenses with it. Uh, and there's lots of land use regulations that aren't accommodating um, different ways of, of, of building. So when it comes to infrastructure, um, big implications, cities are really starting to embrace this now. A place like New York City uh, may be a little bit of an outlier, but they expect to invest about $2.5 billion in what they call green infrastructure over the next couple of decades trying to accommodate things like water runoff, stormwater runoff, instead of building different kind of infrastructure to take that water and channel it out of the city, out of the metropolitan area, um, you know, in the traditional ways that we would accommodate that. Trying to, to, to figure out ways that we can capture it and then get co-benefits. You build parks, you build green infrastructure, it has bigger benefits than just gray infrastructure alone. The other big challenge is when it comes to our, our energy network and how we're moving a lot of the domestic energy that's being produced, uh, particularly in the upper Great Plains. We're all familiar with what's going on um, up there. About 400 million barrels of crude oil are being moved by rail annually, up from just 20 million barrels just a few years ago. So huge impacts when it comes to the freight and the transportation network to move all of that energy, and it shows no signs of abating now. Next big trend is around technological disruptions. Um, there are, uh, McKinsey and other folks have shown that there are these, emergence, these emerging technology platforms that are going to generate trillions and trillions of dollars um, in the global marketplace uh, in just a few years. Things like um, mobile telecommunications, 3D printing, all these things are having huge disruptions technologically. Big opportunities when it comes to, um, on, on the transportation space, to use, to use the infrastructure a little bit better, to deploy technology so we can squeeze the efficiencies out of the system instead of, again, traditionally building in the old kind of ways. 
The big challenge is, of course, we all know, familiar with what's happening with automation and the big impacts we think that might have uh, on the American workforce and which jobs are at the most risk uh, of this automation. And so on the, on the infrastructure side, on the transport side, major attention being given to the big changes that we think are happening when it comes to autonomous vehicles. I think that we need to, to have a little more perspective. This is not happening overnight. It's, I mean, it's, the changes are happening overnight, but we're not going to have full-scale deployment for a number of years. I think this is a, a nice uh, conservative assessment of when we can expect to have full saturation of electric vehicle, of autonomous vehicles. Um, it may take another 20, 25 years, but this is probably what we're looking at. It's not happening overnight, but when it does happen, I think it is going to have huge implications um, for metropolitan areas and for how people are getting around um, because of, what, of the promises of, like, of autonomous vehicles. All this is then wrapped up in this idea of smart cities taking technology and blowing it through these cities, taking every piece of the built environment and making it more technologically enabled, the Internet of Things, all of that, huge um, estimates for how much we're going to be investing in smart cities over the next couple of decades. We'll talk about that later. And the last big challenge then, of course, is the political and the financial. Again, those four things are, are happening anyway. Um, this is the big, the big challenge, I think, that we're facing. When you have quotes like this coming from sitting U.S. senators or former um, or anybody else, when they think about just the impact that the American Congress is having and how it's preventing um, economic growth, you know, we, we know we really have some challenges. But even if we had a functioning government right now, which, we, which you can argue we don't, there are huge changes that are happening, structural changes that are happening to the federal government that are going to squeeze out investments in infrastructure, no matter what happens um, politically. Big increases in mandatory spending, big increases in debt service that we're going to have to do. All that is going to squeeze out discretionary spending. You can see here estimates from 2012 of 40 percent down to 24 percent in just a couple of years. Everything else is packed up into this discretionary spending category. Defense, education, R&D, things like that and infrastructure, housing. So there's going to be a squeeze out on the federal level, irrespective of what happens uh, in November. Now, it's good, I think, that the, during the campaign, people are actually talking about infrastructure. Donald Trump seems to love infrastructure. He talks about it all the time. Um, and a few candidates do seem to be talking about how important it is. But again, it's a very abstract terms. Uh, I think um, Hillary Clinton is the only one who has a, a detailed plan that she's actually laid out for infrastructure. She has a way to pay for it. But even that, I think you can, you can drive some holes through it. Um, they're talking about it. They recognize that it's important. But it's really just a campaign bullet point right now. It's really not being incorporated, I think, very well um, throughout, the, throughout the campaign conversation. The last big thing the federal government did when it comes to infrastructure is this, uh, this law called the FAST Act. It's an acronym for something. I can't think of what it's called. They're very good at coming up with these acronyms. But this is a major transportation bill. Um, it's a five-year bill worth about $30 billion. And that sounds great. Um, but this is the bare minimum of what Congress was supposed to have been doing. Um, there's been lots of calls for them to invest in transportation infrastructure, but because we haven't raised the federal gasoline tax, because there's a lot less money to go around, as I mentioned, this really represents nothing more than kind of the status quo. It has certainty over the next couple of years, so we know it's going to happen. But the strong signal that this bill, I think, sent to cities, states, and metropolitan areas is that the federal government is not coming to the rescue anytime soon. This is the best we're going to do. You guys are on your own. $300 billion is not, it's not nothing. It's a lot of money, but that's it. That's all that's going to happen on the federal level. We should talk about that too. So with that, so those are the, the, the big factors I think that are affecting infrastructure. So it's not just an infrastructure conversation in the abstract. It's not just an engineering conversation. It's not just a conversation about how we're, you know, the nuts and bolts of getting projects done. That, that's important. We should talk about that. But it's those big, those big factors that are really having big impacts um, on the infrastructure network today. The challenge then I think that we're having is that even though we've pushed it to the front burner, it's still a two of an abstract conversation uh, and it's not tangible enough for us to actually move stuff forward. So what we've done at the Metro program is try to define infrastructure as best as we can um, because it's not, it, you know, it, it, it actually means something. It's actually tangible stuff. So we categorize it into these seven different categories. We take transportation and split it up twice into inter-metropolitan area transport and inter, so how you move around within places and how you connect between them. Uh, we take trade and logistics and we separate that out. Water is separate, energy is separate, telecommunications is separate, and then we have this other category for public works, 
um, and buildings. This is a lot of the very local kind of civic infrastructure. And the reason I mention that and the reason we lay all this out is because all of these different sectors, and the why we categorize them this way, because these different sectors are designed, governed, financed, and delivered very differently. Right? There's, not a, there's, not a, there's not an infrastructure program anywhere. There's not an infrastructure law or infrastructure policy. It's all slid up into these different kind of categories. So in order to get beyond this abstractness and to get very specific, we have to start talking about it in these different categories. The other challenge is that within these sectors, there are people who are working pretty much as exclusively in energy and exclusively in water or exclusively in broadband, things like that. We all know that these things are all linked up and they all work together and it's a big system of systems and water and energy and transport are all fundamentally connected. But the reality is that if you're going to get stuff done, you got to get into these individual sectors just because they're delivered and governed and financed differently. They link up at the margins, but they're, they're different, uh, different regimes, different policy apparatuses. The other problem then with, with, uh, with being general about infrastructure is that it really overemphasizes the federal role. When we say infrastructure, people think, well, that's huge, and we have these big assessments that come out from the civil engineers and other well-meaning folks every couple of years that show we have you know, a $3 trillion infrastructure deficit. You've probably all seen these numbers every couple of years, and people kind of roll their eyes and say, well, that's an impossible task. There's nothing we can do about that. That's probably something the federal government's got to work on, because it's just too big for us to deal with and us to bite off. And the federal government should have a role, but the reality is the federal government only has a very relatively small role when it comes to spending on infrastructure. And even in sectors like transportation, both inter and intra metro, and water, which are generally dominated by the public sector, um, it's only about 27% of all the spending comes from the federal government. Um, and that hasn't really changed much over time. There, there have been spikes over the years, but the federal role is actually not as big, I think, as people um, think it is. The problem then with this, with, the, um, with this misunderstanding is that we tend to look for silver bullet kind of solutions. Things like an infrastructure bank. You all may have heard that the, the Obama administration proposed this. I think Hillary Clinton has proposed it. We talk about it a lot, but people don't really kind of know what it means. And I think we need to get beyond these silver bullet conversations. We do need an infrastructure bank, but it's not going to solve all of these, these big, big problems. The third thing then is that this lack of precision means that we fail to address uh, big national priorities. As we're shifting the American economy away post-recession from the economy that predated the recession, which was built around things like consumption, financial shenanigans in Wall Street, and we're shifting to more of a production economy where we're focusing more on, on getting back to building things again, we're failing to link that up with the conversation uh, around infrastructure. So, we're not taking advantage and we're not leveraging that and we're not using infrastructure as a way to drive this new model of economic growth. It's still very traditional and as Bill and I and other folks have talked about over these last couple of days, it's really disconnected from larger conversations around economic growth uh, and development. Uh, you'd be really surprised in many states and many cities, the economic development director will sit over here, the transport or whatever infrastructure director will sit over here and they don't even link up that often. So, I think it's because it's abstract and because it's not very specific that we fail to do that. So that's a big problem that we need to get beyond as well. But the big question, and you know, even given all of that, the challenge that we're having mostly in this country, unfortunately, is how we're going to pay for all the stuff that we need right now. Even if we addressed all those problems that I said, even if we had a very, uh, very tangible and very sophisticated conversation around infrastructure, we still are lacking um, a lot of the resources. We're still lacking a lot of the innovation. We're still not leveraging the investments that we have right now to pay for all the stuff um, that we need. So the third part then of the presentation, the thing I want to end you with is kind of then what that new path forward would look like. And this is where I want to get much more specific because we want to get away from thinking about what the federal government can do. What are these big giant plays when it comes to infrastructure and focus on what actually is happening. And it's not happening in Washington, in federal Washington. Um, the states are kind of a mixed bag. It's really happening on the local level, the metropolitan level, and because infrastructure is so important to folks in the local uh, and the metro level, there's an absolutely insatiable demand for folks to learn from one another. Uh, they don't come into Washington anymore and talk to us at Brookings and then go meet with their, de their delegation on Capitol Hill. They come and meet with us and they say, can you introduce us to the folks in Chicago because we know that they're doing some interesting stuff or the folks in Atlanta, or the folks in Chattanooga, or the folks in Los Angeles. That's where the action is right now, and that's where I want to, to end this with, is to talk about the things that are happening 
uh, out in the real world. So again, we have to kind of split this up into different sectors. The first thing is that I think the public sector is going to continue to drive an awful lot um, of these infrastructure investments, but only in certain, in certain kind of categories. Things like transportation, things like water, the public sector is going to be heavily involved in those places. And the message that the federal government has been sending that the states and the metropolitan areas have picked up on very well is that they're going to have to go directly to the voters and ask them to approve uh, investments in infrastructure. This is something that folks here in the Inner Mountain West uh, I think know better than anybody. You have a very long tradition of this. This is kind of the culture here uh, of the Mountain West. This pull yourself up by the bootstraps and get stuff done by yourself. This is not uh, very uh, traditional for the, the Northeast and the Midwest in particular, but it's starting to be. And part of the reason it's starting to be is that people are starting to see that it's a different conversation when you go into these places and you ask voters to approve infrastructure investments they're very willing to do that. I think it's a myth that Americans don't want to pay for infrastructure. They don't want to pay for the federal gasoline tax because they don't see where it's going. We're going to raise your gas tax by 25 cents and that money is going to go into some transportation trust fund that you're not really sure how it's, how it's organized. Then some formula is going to send it out to the states and they're going to make good decisions. It's, it's too abstract for folks. It's too disconnected to their real lives. When we're going towards the voters, it means that you're going to go to on election day and it's going to say, we're going to invest in this project, we're going to raise your tax by this much, it's going to start this day, it's going to sunset this day, and here are the impacts. When folks see those kinds of, specif those kinds of specifics, they're very willing uh, to raise their taxes and to invest. The proof is in the pudding, about 70 to 70% 70 of these things are passing on election day um, for transportation. We don't do it for a lot of other sectors of infrastructure, but for these, um, they pass pretty wildly. And the interesting thing is the ones that don't pass are the ones that are probably dumb projects to begin with. The public is really good at picking out what a bad infrastructure project is and what a good one is. And when they put together good ones, again, they're willing to pay for them. So one good example um, out here, uh, here in the West is in Los Angeles where they passed something called Measure R right in the middle of the recession. This is when unemployment in LA County was 19, 20% huge unemployment. People were really, really struggling, but they came with a very, very bold, very far-reaching uh, measure and asked voters to approve a sales tax increase um, for 30 years to generate about $40 billion to invest in all different types of infrastructure, particularly to build out uh, the mass transit system there. Uh, so big fixed route transit investments, some investments in highway capital, mostly around um, carpool lanes, things like that, or addressing pinch points. Not a massive highway building program, but a rational, thoughtful one um, that that region needed. This is really about taking Los Angeles and making it truly the global city that it should become. And they recognized that public transit was a big piece to that. And right now they're reaping the benefits. I can tell you that Los Angeles is really well positioned. They have a ton of money that they're investing in their transit infrastructure. And the, the voters there not only approved it once, they had to approve it, I think they had to approve a, uh, oh, they had to, to, to push back a referendum to get rid of this sales tax. And they had in Los Angeles and California, you had to get it by two thirds. So very, very popular. A lot of folks have seen the progress they made uh, there in LA. Another thing that the public sector is doing is trying to, to modernize the way that we think about the intersection between infrastructure and land use. So the way that we would normally do it in this country, they, back in the Eisenhower era is the the government would pay for the infrastructure investment and if you were lucky enough to own the land near that investment you would have a huge windfall because your property would have increased in value tremendously because of the access that this infrastructure investment uh, gave to you. What they're trying to do now is to capture that increase uh, in, in value and reinvest that back into the, to the infrastructure investment itself. This is the idea called land value capture. We haven't done it that much here in this country but there's a lot of interest in doing this. A great example is in uh, Washington, D.C., where they built an infill station on an existing rail line um, in an area that the city wanted to reinvest in anyway. It was a kind of a downtrodden area. They knew that they put a station in there, redeveloped around the station. It would be a big boost um, to, the local, to the local neighborhood. And that's exactly what happened. The landowner near there is making so much money, he's laughing all the way to the bank because now all of a sudden he had access to this world-class transit system. For their part, I think the federal government, um, you know, is, is they're not going away. They're, they're again, they're, they're, they're kind of doing the status quo. They're not in, increasing their investments by much um, uh, in the near future. 
but they're still present. They still should be doing some, uh, certain things. Partly what they should be doing is, is getting out of the way, right, and allowing places to innovate and allow them to do things um, that they want to do and not, if you're not going to come with more money, you got to let the states and the metropolitan areas do what they want to do. One thing is that they, the, the, the cities want to do is to raise this passenger facility charge in airports, which is artificially capped right now by the federal government. There are places like Dallas that are chomping at the bit to raise this so they can take that money and dramatically expand these airports. The federal government right now is standing in the way. They should get out of that. They also should get rid of the tolling restrictions on the interstates. It may, be, it may, have, it may have made sense in the 1950s and 60s when we thought about the interstates as you know, literally crossing the continent. But now the interstates, as you know here, they run through the middle of these cities. They run through downtowns. Those are perfect candidates for things that could be told so that we can not just generate revenue from those, from those investments, but you can actually manage traffic much better. The federal government right now has this artificial um, restriction against that. And then broadly, this means a policy, what we call modality neutrality. We're one of the only industrialized countries on the planet that has, we have a federal transit administration, a federal highway administration, aviation administration, railroad administration. It's crazy. It's a crazy way to run a railroad. Excuse the pun. We have to get away from that. We've got to think about it more as a transportation system and not in these separate siloed categories. That's an easy, well, it's a, it's a clear thing the federal government should do. I'm not saying it's easy, but they should do it. The second thing then is that I think a lot of these new investments are going to require new kinds of partnerships. What I'd laid out from the public sector is pretty much all that's going to be happening. Um, you know, there's, there's, they're still reinvesting a lot of their own money, but they're looking tremendously for new kinds of partnerships so that we can take advantage, particularly in a lot of the private capital that's floating around right now that is dying to invest um, in infrastructure because they see opportunities. Now, I know this is a complicated chart, but the point here is to show that there's lots of different ways for the public and the private sector to work together. The first thing that people think about when you say, well, the private sector could take over some infrastructure is that we're, we're selling out. They're selling pub our public infrastructure to private companies, and all they're going to want to do is make money on it. And that last part is true. The private sector motivations are actually very easy to understand. They're trying to make money. That's basically it. They want to get deals done. They want to generate some revenue for their, for, for their company and their shareholders. It's the public sector uh, motivations that are usually different uh, and confused and may change when mayors come in and out and, and the other thing. But what the sophisticated um, cities and states and metros are doing is figuring out how to work well with the private sector so you can actually get projects that they're willing to invest in, but you also can meet a bunch of public policy goals uh, and objectives for things you may not have been able to do by yourselves. So there's lots of different ways that you can split this up. You can see from the chart here. But the important thing is there on the end. When we're thinking about these partnerships, the ownership of the infrastructure asset always remains with the public sector. They're not selling off infrastructure assets. They're just different ways to design them, to build them, to maintain them. And then the risks are shared between the public and the private sector. That's the key thing here. This is not about hosing the private sector so we're getting a deal, we're screwing them over. It's not about selling out you know, for, the, for the general public. It's truly about finding that right balance of risks um, and rewards so you can truly get a win-win um, for, these, for these investments. So we like what they're doing um, on the West Coast. There's, a, there's a, a coalition called the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange, which is a partnership between the three states on the West Coast and British Columbia, which is really important because Canada has been a global leader in, in engaging in these kinds of public-private partnerships. They have sophistication, they have the right regulatory environment, and you know if you're a private sector investor, a private sector entity, you can go into British Columbia and you're going to get a fair deal. You may not get the deal done, but you can see the hurdles kind of along the way, and they're actually going to work with you to, see, to, to get to the right mix. The idea is to build a pipeline of projects so that you're not just dealing one-offs with the private sector. We're doing a project here and a project here and a project here, but it's more of a, of a, of a shopping list or a cafeteria list of, of investments. Things like uh, standards, um, contractual arrangements, are all designed to speed the process so we can actually can get some deals done. We like what's starting to happen there now. And these kinds of infrastructure exchanges are starting to pop up throughout the rest of the country. There's one in coming out of Colorado, there's one in the Northeast, and I think we're going to see some interesting things from these places soon. <clears throat> Another great example of a partnership is this thing called the Port of Miami Tunnel, um, which, is, which connects um, downtown Miami to the, to the, to the seaport that's there. Um, the, previously, the, the trucks were coming out of the port and were being dumped off literally onto the city of Miami streets. It was an intolerable um, 
uh, situation for everybody, but there really wasn't any money to pay for it. The port was strapped, the city was strapped, the state was strapped. They engaged in this partnership with a private sector entity um, where they uh, use the fees that are coming in from the, from the port, from the trucks that are actually contrib that contributed to the cost of the infrastructure asset itself. Um, it was completed just recently. Uh, it was a very expensive tunnel, um, but it has huge impacts because now the port can function um, in, in a much more efficient way, much more um, activity is happening there. And in the meantime, it's not dumping all this traffic onto the city streets um, of Miami. They use something that's called an availability payment where, this, where the private sector entity is being paid because they're keeping the, the, the tunnel available, making it available for folks. So it's basically a service that they're, that they're providing, but there's no transfer of risk to the public sector, meaning if for whatever reason, nobody wants to use the Port of Miami anymore, um, the public sector is not at risk of having to absorb those costs in the long term. The last um, partnership example I wanted to mention is what's happening in, in, in New Jersey with the, the Bayonne Water Authority. Um, this is a city that was facing tremendous um, debt burden, kind of post-recession, enormous challenges that they're facing with their budget. And they realized we have this tremendous asset right here. We have this, this water authority, um, which is something that is actually attractive to a private sector entity. And so it's exactly what happened. Um, the city wanted to improve the operations. They want to, to retain the ownership, and they really want to protect their workers, like unionized workers um, in New Jersey, um, and that if they just sold off this asset, it would have been tremendously uh, problematic for, for the city and for the mayor and everybody else. They engage in a partnership with a, with a private equity firm and with a firm that, that is professionally running these water systems. Um, they paid off the debt. They're making money. Um, everybody's happy, except the one thing that did happen is they had to raise the rates um, to pay for a lot of this. This is something that the public sector was not willing to do. They didn't want to engage in that political risk. They were able to kind of offload that to the private entity here. I know that makes people kind of upset, but this is something that they couldn't have got done anyway because they engaged in this partnership, they were able to get it done. <clears throat> the third thing then is that there's a lot of other areas of infrastructure that are still just gonna be dominated by the private sector. Again, all this stuff is not just run by the government. Um, they're run by private sector entities that's just the history that we've done it here in this country. But what's changing is that they're actually starting to work better with the public sector so that we're meeting both the private sector goals and then the public sector goals of, uh, for public policy interest. So a good example we like is what's happening in Los Angeles with this community broadband network where um, the city realized that they had, in order to, to connect their students in particular um, to, uh, to educational opportunities that, that were emerging through broadband connectivity, they went out with an RFP, which is not something the city was gonna build, but they need to figure out, well, how is a private sector entity gonna come in, build out this broadband infrastructure, and still make money, especially if you're trying to outfit low-income neighborhoods. So it's an interesting arrangement. We like what's going on there, um, where the private sector is, used, is bearing the construction costs. The city is guaranteeing that they're gonna, that they're gonna make bottom line money, because the city is gonna be a big investor um, in the service. And then a good example also um, in New York City, real estate and buildings are one area where the private sector has always been heavily engaged in infrastructure. It's not an area where we have a lot of, you know, a lot of public buildings in this way. But here New York City wants to diversify their economy post-recession, move it away from the emphasis on, on finance, which took a big hit obviously during the recession, and capitalize on um, the STEM education, which really wasn't something that they were doing very well in New York City um, kind of post-recession. They had this island in the East River, um, Roosevelt Island, which is very underutilized, but which had a subway station, surprisingly enough. And so they were able to work with the private sector entity, with the university um, in upstate New York, I think it was with Cornell, um, to, build, to build this out into a, an advanced science center. Again, meeting the public sector goals of diversifying its economy and providing a tremendous opportunity um, for private sector entities to make an awful lot of money with this big real estate deal. So we can talk about lots of different things. I'll, I'll leave some time in the, for the Q&A at the end. Um, but I think that what we're seeing, again, is, is, is a lot of progress that's being made when it comes to infrastructure. Um, again, being pushed to the front burner, kind of more of a natural part of the policy discourse. But we have a long, long way to go. We've got to figure out ways to, to move beyond the traditional way that we invested um, and take advantage of some of these new, um, these new innovations that are happening now. But I think the biggest thing we have to do is to stop talking about infrastructure by itself. 
If we can make any progress, we've got to make sure that when we're talking about economic growth, there's an infrastructure component under that. When we're talking about environmental sustainability, that there's an infrastructure component under that. When we're talking about social equity, there's an infrastructure component under that. So long as it's an infrastructure conversation, it's going to stay removed from the national discourse. By incorporating that into everything else we're doing, I think we can make much more progress. I'm optimistic. I think we can do this. I think it's being led by cities and metropolitan areas. And hopefully at some point, Congress will listen uh, and we'll get some things done nationally. I want to thank you all very much um, for your time and attention. I want to thank um, Brooklyn's Mountain West for having me here today. And I look forward to all your questions and comments. Go right here. Yes, it's uh, it, uh, it, uh, energy infrastructure is very interesting to me, and uh, I know it, it presents, and we're really seeing that here in, in Nevada, presents an interesting thing with a regulated monopoly, but possibly owned by private equity or owned by large business interests because we're trying to obviously move forward uh, and, and uh, you know, Putting a priority on health and, and public wellness, I think, makes a lot of sense. But then we just had a legislature which not only made solar hard and the utility made solar hard, but they also pushed off into the future, finishing off uh, leaving coal. We're only down to one plant in Nevada. But instead of accelerating or sticking to a goal, they pushed it back. And of course, they also made rooftop solar much less affordable and, uh, and, and, and really not affordable mm -hmm. in the capital of the, the Anyway, so do you have any particular ways, I, I guess, that takes civic action? I know actually there are some ballot measures, there's some things like that planned. I know Solar City, some others are getting into an actual ballot measure. Yep. I guess that's one way, but anyway, what, what, how do you address though, that kind of, of, of uh, Right. So the question is broadly about, in, about energy infrastructure and how do we diversify kind of, and, and then how do we make big bets on different types of, of, of energy production. And this is tough and this is, this is something that is changing, I think, quite a bit. The big change I think that's happened is that we've, it's, kind of, it's moved away from, and this is just my own um, perspective on this, it's moved away from an environmental imperative and kind of a, a low carbon imperative, um, which is what drives a lot of the conversation, particularly in Europe, which a lot of the infrastructure investments have a big carbon component to it. And it's the, the, the um, elected leadership talks about it, um, general public talks about it, they just, low carbon is a big thing that they're doing, they're all bought in. That's not the conversation obviously here in the United States, it really is about a market opportunity. Um, how that's playing out in different states, you know, is you know, as you, as you said, it's playing out in Nevada in a very different way. It's playing out in California. It's playing out in New Jersey. Um, but I think it is around making sure that the the, um, the the state leadership, in particular, who's setting the rules and regulations, is connecting it then to this to larger efforts around economic growth and development. So long as it's still staying about, if it's an environmental, we we, we should be focusing on the environment for lots of different reasons. But I think making it part of a large scale. Um, statewide plan on economic development is the way to go. Now I say that knowing that's a very naive statement, especially given all the stuff that we've talked about this last week about the politics here in Nevada. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not sure I understand it all completely, but I think that that's what seems to be changing the conversation um, in other places. Yes, ma'am. Can you Sorry. Um, uh, I had a question about uh, the international dimension of this. I mean, you, you kind of mentioned um, British Columbia, but how much more of our infrastructure are, are places looking towards international um, players, either both from a public sector uh, dimension or you know, maybe multinational companies? Yes, great question around the international connections. I think that, so a lot of the actions is certainly within the U.S. and the U.S. cities are looking at each other. Um, and then part of it is this challenge we just mentioned that the, the motivation is different in different places. Again, I think it's, it's low carbon in, in Europe. It's spatial efficiency in Asia because of the big urbanization challenges. Here it's around, I think, economic growth and development, and, and you know, that's basically it. Um, we haven't done a lot of these partnerships with the private sector well in this country. We're just starting in a lot of this because um, we've had the tax-free municipal bond market, which has paid for an awful lot of infrastructure over the last several generations. 
But post-recession, even as these localities are starting to recover, we haven't seen an increase in, in borrowing again. So they're not going back to the market in the same way as we thought they were. Um, again, some states are, are still in financial um, straits. Um, but I think that a lot of the localities are still, are still very gun-shy, and they're still feeling the effects of the, of the recession and very risk and, and debt-averse right now. So the motivation then for engaging in these partnerships um, is mostly financially driven, which is not the way we should be doing that. We should be getting into it because of the efficiencies and the risk sharing and all the stuff I talked about. But the reality is it's the financial reason that's why we're in it. So that's what's prompting a lot of the international comparisons right now. The, the best examples that we're pulling um, are from, we said Canada is one. Um, there's lots of different places in Europe, South Africa, Australia, um, Latin America, there's a bunch of good examples. And then the multinational firms are looking at the US as basically an emerging market when it comes to infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of Japanese firms that are starting to want to build things like high-speed rail uh, and to use the US as a testing ground. So that you can build, they're trying to build a private light rail, a private high-speed rail line right now between Dallas and Houston as a way to demonstrate Japanese technology and high-speed rail. So really, we are kind of a, a, an emerging market for them. Um, but the international comparisons only go so far because each country does these things differently. As I said, our freight rail network, for example, which is the envy of the world over, is entirely private owned and operated. The, the, the government gave them the land a long time ago, we know all that. Um, but so the, the international comparisons actually go both ways. And they're starting to take the lessons that we have on freight rail and incorporating those into other places as well. Can you prioritize nationally what infrastructure needs replacement, modernization, is in, in, in worse shape that really needs to change for the 21st century? That's a good question. We get this a lot, and, I, and I, you would think I have a good answer for it, because a lot of folks intuitively ask this question. And I don't know the answer, because there's, there, there's a lot of competing priorities. But I think the one thing, and this was even before Flint, I think the water, we have a big problem coming up when it comes to water infrastructure. And Flint was just, uh, it kind of really pushed this um, and made it much more of a national conversation. But the water infrastructure is horribly neglected. It's literally underground and invisible, and so people don't really know about it. Um, and you may have all seen stories. And we have 100-plus-year-old pipes in many, many major metropolitan areas. We have pipes made out of wood in a lot of places in Philadelphia and in, and in Seattle. Um, I think the innovations that we can, we can uh, undertake is all of this around green infrastructure. Um, and we're seeing a lot of very, quote unquote, progressive water utilities starting to recognize that the way that we were engineering the water systems before is, is, is an old model. We've got to stop building this gray infrastructure to channel water and get it out of places and then dump it somewhere else and just cause another problem downstream and, cha and harness it now. So it's this green infrastructure investments that New York, um, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., a lot of places are starting to pioneer are much cheaper. It's much more environmentally um, safe and conscious. And then they're getting these, again, these co-benefits, building parks and other things kind of out of the green infrastructure space. So I'm optimistic we're going to see some investments in water. And I know that there's a lot of private sector um, interest because you have rate payers. Everybody needs it. Um, and it's a place that's dying for innovation. I don't want to miss anybody. Uh... I think we're going to have a question from one of the 11% you were referring to before. <laughs> hey, so uh, just on the, the, the federal uh, role, as far as funding infrastructure, we talk about how it's, what, just over a quarter percent of overall infrastructure spending. But it seems to be uh, there's a lot of focus on transportation. And in particular, when you talk about the in, uh, intra-metro type uh, systems, how do you think the, the, you know, the federal government has certain policies that they're pushing forward? How do you think, you know, when sometimes those are, are, are in contrast to maybe what are priorities at the local level, um, it, it, it sometimes uh, kind of loses the efficiency of implementing projects and, and, and enabling those type of investments? How, how do you think that could maybe uh, be changed to make it a little bit more uh, uh, a little bit more efficient and, and uh, to enable those type of investments to come from the federal level, you know, how can we get some alignment between federal policy and, and maybe what local uh, communities want to see? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, especially when it comes to what we call surface transportation, roads, 
roads and bridges, and then transit. That's kind of like I think it's what you were talking about. Um, I mean, the federal the federal role is actually, even though they're spending a lot of money, they don't really they don't really direct a lot of that money. The money that comes into the federal transportation trust fund goes back out to the states in basically the same condition it came in at. Um, I mean, we have these pol these equity policies, so you're guaranteed as much money as you contribute to the trust fund. That's how much money you're going to get back. That money doesn't really t isn't really tied to anything. You can spend it on almost any conceivable transportation purpose. The money is highly flexible. There's no performance measures really. They're starting to do those. Um, there's really no accountability. We don't really know how the money is spent. So it's as close to a blank check as the federal government writes to the states. Um, so it, the, the the challenge may be more. It's not really the disconnect between the localities and the federal government. It's between the localities and the states. The states are in, in so much charge of, of spending a lot of that money. Um, the federal government doesn't have a whole lot. To, they really leave the states um, in charge of that. And so that said, a lot of states are actually trying to do things differently. And they're starting to recognize how important the major metros are and how important those transport investments are. And so a lot of places we're seeing that, that direct linkage um, where they're, you know, a place like, a, um, a place like Virginia is doing this, Colorado, Washington State, Oregon, there's a bunch of places you can point to, um, Minnesota to some extent, um, where they're, they're starting to really recognize that these investments are so important to these localities that they're working closely with them. Now what I've learned from the last couple of days talking to folks here in, in this region that that disconnect is, is, is pervasive here in this, in this state. Um, I think for the, the state to be healthy and vital, they've got to recognize the importance of, of this region and particularly the importance of this, the right kind of transport um, investments they're going to have in this region. But it's mostly driven, again, between the states and localities, not so much the federal government, I think. Sir, in the back. Yeah, uh, you already mentioned that your sons didn't get the driver's license. And that's kind of, you know, the growing back among those millennials. So from the local elected officials or the policy makers' perspective, Yes, there is a diversified demand for the transportation infrastructure. So was it last part, I'm sorry? Uh, there is a di diversified demand for the transportation infrastructure. For, uh, for instance, those baby boomers or the echo generation of the baby boomers, baby boomers and the millennials, all three different groups might come up with a different ideas of this is what we need for the transportation. But I think some of the challenges the local and state elected officials or the policymakers may face is, okay, what should be our focus group? Like, you know, we cannot satisfy all those demands at the same time. So should be more focusing on the millennials, more like futuristic type of, you know, is that the right path? I know it may vary by regions, it may, it may vary by institutions, but do you have any ideas on how, what would be the strategy to work with those type of yeah, I, think, I, don't think it's, I don't think they need to choose between, between different segments. I don't think they're actually as different as, as you may think. I think they're, the, the changes that are starting to happen it's not, I don't believe it's because uh, millennials or, or younger folks uh, have, don't want to be driving or, 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 or anti-car, anything like that. You get a lot of this, this attention to it. I think that anybody, millennials, seniors, anybody in between, will take the most efficient, convenient, reliable, cheapest way of transportation that they can take to get whatever task it is done. I don't believe it's that ideological. My kids, for example, I should talk about them on TV here, but the, they're not driving because it's just, a, it's just a pain for them, right? They can get around as much by taking transit and walking and biking um, as they can by having to, to I mean, we're not going to buy them a car anyway, so they would have to save money and have a car. It's just a big burden for them. Um, if it was easier for them to drive, that's probably what they would be doing anyway. So, so that, that's just my own perspective on that. But the cities are actually responding to this in a, in a big, big way. They're moving away from, uh, from policies which look out into the future. And they do all these projections for growth and say, well, we're going to grow by this amount. Every region generally has a good sense of that. And then they build to accommodate that growth. And that mostly means highway construction. That's been the generation, what we've done for the last couple of generations. And that's really changing. They're recognizing that that hasn't really solved congestion. It hasn't really done a lot to improve things like accessibility. It's just then this endless kind of chase. And then you have to maintain more roads and you build and we decentralize, but there are places like in Chicago, in Seattle, Washington, D.C., um, New York, I mean, where a lot of these new city transportation departments are stopping the endless chase after tr uh, congestion relief. 
for example, and are putting together policies in place that recognize all those different modes um, of transportation. So I think the change we're going to see is going to happen from the local level up. I don't think it's going to come from the top down. Um, and I don't think it's just going to be based on one segment of society over another. But it does recognize these big changes that are happening now. So I'm going to have to, is it okay to call on that person? Yeah. That person? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> since, invited you since you mentioned it, you raised the, the question about building endless highways to solve congestion problems in the process, creating more problems, you know, shifting traffic from one place to another, or just, you know, having to maintain all that. Now, we were in this nice, long conversation in this region, led by the RTC, and we have a representative of the RTC over there, our Regional Transportation Commission, on light rail. And then all of a sudden, late the game, some engineer decides our congestion problem could be solved by Robert Moses era styled elevated expressways that cut through the heart of the east side of the strip and deliver people in mass as sort of the world's longest taxi off ramp from the airport. Tell me what other regions are considering that solution rather than transit to deal with multimodality, pedestrian orientation, complete streets. You know, how many other cities do you know? You're all around the country. You see all these cities. How many cities are looking at Robert Moses style solutions at this point? Make no mistake, there are still definitely some places that are, that are starting to do this, yeah, that are well. trying to do this. Most, mostly southeastern metros, where we get calls all the time from folks who, who have the same kind of complaints. I think there was one in Birmingham most recently. They say the State Department of Transportation is not listening to what we're saying here in Birmingham. They're trying to run this, 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 this ridiculous project through that we don't want. So it, does still, it is still happening. It's changing and it's becoming much less. But when it comes to the idea of the elevated freeway, the actual the examples are, the most interesting ones are where we're taking them down. What's really happening more is we're not building up these elevated freeways, despite as folks pointed out that we have it here in my, in my PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's really what, st what cities are trying to do is to, is to remove the elevated freeways, recognizing that they're a huge barrier um, in these places. They're opening up land for development um, and, and kind of flattening these roads so that they're actually creating more of, a, uh, of economic growth in these places because you're able to redevelop. You actually have new land now to develop and you're bringing it all down instead of just blowing people through these communities. So the bigger trend is taking down the elevated freeways instead of putting them up. Um, and then it's all part of, I think, this bigger shift that's happening, which, is, which sounds subtle, but it's really important in the transport um, community, the shift from mobility to accessibility, right? So the focus has been for generations on mobility, just moving people, moving goods, building roads to just move, move, move. And all of our metrics and all of our analyses are around moving those kinds of things. The change that's happening now is around, is to try to, to, to build transport around accessibility. How, what kind of economic opportunity can you access through these particular investments? Um, and it's a subtle change, but it, ch it will change everything if we can start to measure things that way. And the last thing I'll leave you with is we had um, Secretary Anthony Fox, Federal, US, Federal Center, US Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox at Brookings a few, a few weeks ago. And he was talking about, he was paired up with Julian Castro, the uh, HUD Secretary, talking about how housing policy is helping people um, increase their, 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 um, their social mobility, their, not, their, not their transportation mobility, their social mobility, um, and all the good things housing is doing. The transport secretary told this wonderful story. He's an African-American from Charlotte um, who talked about the elevated freeway that, was, that blew through his neighborhood in Charlotte and became a physical barrier between that neighborhood and getting to the economic opportunity that existed in that, in that city. Uh, and talked about how transport was a burden and a an hindrance to economic growth, as opposed to the way we've talked about transport for generations, which is build it, it's all good, just build it, and it's all gonna, it's all gonna work out. This was a dramatic, a dramatic shift. So we're starting to recognize that building all this infrastructure doesn't always work, doesn't always help out all segments of society. Um, and so it's a bigger shift, as the secretary and other folks have, um, around different kind of modes, particularly around rail because of its ability to build up neighborhoods as opposed to just blow through them and knock them down. Thank you, sir. Let me thank you for taking an important and complex subject and putting your creative 
mind around it. And uh, thank you all for your questions. We're going to take next week off from our lecture series. So we'll be back in two weeks, and we'll have a much different focus. We'll, we'll leave the, the metropolitan topic behind, and we'll get into some serious foreign policy issues with uh, the colleague Velda Felbad brown who has been out here before. But she's uh, an expert on global terrorism and has been embedded in some of the most violent and dangerous countries and places in the world, and, and is going to lay out her experiences and her thoughts on how the US can respond to that challenging topic, another highly important and in this election season. So. Or is it three weeks from tonight? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, Did you say two weeks? Two weeks is spring break. That's right. I think it's sorry. three weeks. Thank you for correcting me on that. Sorry. Check your. I just put that three weeks. Yes. 21 days. Check your emails for me. Check our, our website. Don't listen too closely to what I say. And uh, we will be back here. Uh, and Rob will be around if you have a question you didn't care to answer in public. Thanks again. We'll see you soon. <laughs>